All right, let's get going. So um, hi, everyone. For those who didn't um, meet me earlier, I'm Laura Walker McDonald. I'm the Senior Director for Insights and Impact of the Digital Impact Alliance and a grateful board member at the CDAC Network. Um, and I have the privilege of moderating today's sessions. Um, we had a fantastic session this morning, um, which I hope you get to catch later on if you didn't already. Um, and uh, I think really spoke to the theme of this um, this year's public forum, accountability in the age of the algorithm, championing pathways to inclusion in tech-driven futures. And that of course will continue um, after these messages. I have to just walk you through some housekeeping things. If you're new to the AventShare platform, um, just to remind you that you can add questions and comments there, please. Um, we do encourage you to add them. Um, we're going to have a plenary panel later, and there's lots of opportunity to, to have a conversation with our panelists. Um, and so if you can put questions into the AventShare platform and not into Zoom, that would be terrific, but we will see them in either place. Um, if you're having any trouble with the audio, it might be because you've not connected. So you need to, on the bottom of the window, connect, hit a button that says join audio and then hit the blue control button and that should sort it out. Um, on social media, we encourage you to engage with the conference on these hashtags, um, CDAC2020. The CDAC Network's handle is at CDACN and you can always use the trusty commas aid um, hashtag. Um, and then just to remind you that all uh, sessions, including this one, are recorded, um, which means that we can uh, re-watch re watch and share them after the event, and we hope that you will. Um, they will be published on CDAT Network's YouTube channel afterwards. And finally, if you have any challenges during the event and you want some help, you can either reach out through the questions and comments facility in the Eventure platform, or you can email meetings at mformotheryt.uk.com. Um, to get the MYT team to help you, and they will be there to do that. So I think that's all I have to share on the housekeeping. So let's talk a little bit more about the theme. Um, so we're going to be looking, turning now to whose experiences matter. And to start us off here, I'm going to turn to Zoe Hamilton, Insights Manager for Mobile for, Develop for Humanitarian Innovation at GSMA, who will be answering the question, how can humanitarians work with the private sector and marginalized populations to collaboratively design more inclusive mobile technology-based solutions? Zoe, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Zoe Hamilton. Uh, and as Laura mentioned, I'm an insights manager at GSMA on the Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation team. Um, I'm here today to talk about these two reports that we put out recently. Um, the first called the Digital Lives of Refugees and Kenyans with Disabilities in Nairobi that looks at how people with disabilities in humanitarian contexts use mobile, the barriers they have when using mobile, and the opportunities that mobile technology can provide. Um, and the second report, Human Centered Design uh, in, in Humanitarian Settings, looking at some of the methodological approaches uh, that we used in this process, which is really where I'm going to focus today. Um, as a bit of background, 10.6 million people with disabilities are displaced globally. We know that in humanitarian contexts, instances of disability are greater. Not only that, but this group is at heightened risk of violence, exploitation, and abuse. Um, and when humanitarian crises do occur, they can be disproportionately affected and can fall through the cracks in terms of accessing aid. Uh, last year, we put out this report, uh, which for the first time measured the mobile gap in ownership and use for mobile technologies in humanitarian settings. And we know that it's, it's important to take this population into account, especially as the humanitarian sector is increasingly relying upon mobile technology to deliver humanitarian information services and support. Uh, so we wanted to do this research project to better understand how this group is currently using mobile technology the barriers that they're facing when using mobile technology and the opportunities that mobile technology can provide to address some of the challenges that they face. Alongside this, we wanted to document the methodology that we used throughout the process because we used a very participative human-centered design methodology, um, and we thought that there could be some lessons learned for the greater sector. Um, and finally, we wanted to co-create ideas alongside our partners. So in this case, we were working with Safaricom and UNHCR in Nairobi. Um, the methods that we used, as I mentioned, were, were human-centered design 
what does that actually mean? Of course, it's, it's become a bit of a buzzword in the sector, but in the simplest terms, it's a practical and iterative approach to problem solving that integrates various perspectives, but really centers on that of the user, letting them guide the, the research, including the, the topic areas that, that we focus on. Um, and, and all of the tools really focus on helping the researcher put themselves into the shoes of the user so that we can craft programming that's contact specific, that's relevant uh, to their needs. Uh, this is particularly useful when working with marginalized populations who are facing intersecting barriers to understand what those challenges are. Um, so the toolkit includes five different tools uh, alongside tips for inclusivity. So how we adapted these tools to, to make them accessible and truly deeply participative uh, for the participants, which uh, in this case had he hearing and seeing uh, impairments. So those tools include location mapping, user journeys, communication maps, future me and daily diaries. To give you one example, a user journey is a way of, of mapping a process and understanding the pain points that a user might have when going through that. Uh, it can be useful when understanding current services and the challenges that are faced there to ideate solutions. It can also be used uh, to test a solution, to iterate a solution, so all different parts through the program design. Um, some of the tips that we included for how to make these services more inclusive I've, I've included here. So one of the things we found that was including a variety of mediums and materials. So for the visually impaired, we would have mapping exercises where people could use clay or objects and, and place them on, on the map. Um, similarly, for, for daily diaries, we allowed people to, to do a variety of different ways of, of keeping track of their daily, daily challenges, um, daily experiences, whether that be uh, recording on audio, taking photos, uh, writing things down, having a call from one of our, one of our facilitators. Um, second, it was really important to allow space and offer support. The group reported that they didn't often have the opportunity to provide feedback, and so they wanted to report back on many different challenges they were facing in their lives. So it was very important to have UNHCR as a partner who we could rely on to follow up on some of these challenges and make sure they were addressed. Um, third, considering accessibility throughout the project. So not just in the research tools, but also in the research location, making sure that that was accessible or we realized certain times of day uh, were more accessible. Um, it, equally, having sign translators and, and making sure that translators were available for various local languages was really important. Um, ensuring autonomy, but also including caregivers. This was a bit of a, a difficult balance because caregivers would sometimes accompany participants to the event and we wanted to incorporate their perspective without taking away from the users. So what we ended up doing was have them do the same activities in parallel. So maybe at a separate table to also integrate that perspective. Uh, and then finally, moving between working with both groups and individuals. So sometimes we found having a brainstorming activity as a, as a group would loosen people up uh, and, then, and then moving to the individuals to understand their individual experiences. Um, and now I'd like to show a video of some of the, the users talking about the methodology from their perspectives. Um, I think it's important in the research process as well as in programming to be responsive to communities to take, bring it back to them, understand their perspectives on if we captured the research accurately and, and what they thought of the methodology. Um, I just wanted to note that everyone who participated in this volunteered, um, and of course we gathered informed consent, uh, and the video has no audio, so if you're not hearing audio, that's intentional.
Great. So thank you so much. Um, I'll hand back over to, to Laura for the rest of the session, but happy to answer questions later. Wow, thank you so much. That was wonderful. That is, for me, unfortunately, groundbreaking in a humanitarian conference, and I am so appreciative. Thank you. Um, yeah, very interesting. All right, so I'm going to turn over now to um, representation in um, in digital spaces. So what's the role for data subjects in the design, deployment, and governance of technology used to manage humanitarian assistance? So this session is really going to look at power um, in the context of platforms and the people in the humanitarian sphere. And the session is being led by Indu Nepal, who is the communication engagement lead at the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Indu, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. I think now I'm unmuted. If I could invite all the panelists to turn their cameras on and unmute for a little bit. Um, thank you so much, Laura. This panel will really build on the conversation from the last panel, actually, where we discussed participatory digital governments, governance. Um, and good afternoon, good evening. Thank you to all the panelists who made the time to join us today. I'm going to do a brief intro on what we'll look into this panel and going to introduce the panelists before we jump into some of the questions that we'd like to unpack today. Um, so as has been discussed in the past two days and panels before us, digital tools play an important role in delivery of humanitarian assistance and services. The use of tech uh, in this context is framed as providing better services, cheaper, faster, uh, but also providing accountability, to, for example, to prevent fraud. Um, examples include specialized uh, programs such as use of Iris Guard. Closer to my work and the sector more broadly is also use of hotlines and associated databases. And finally, of course, there is the broader social media where the governance is very different because we're tapping into existing tools on which we have pretty much no influence. So um, in this context, humanitarian organizations hold immense power as provider of services. They gather, share, store enormous amount of data on people that are affected by conflict and crisis. Uh, people who give up data to access the services may not have much choice, even if informed consent is secured to what happens to their data. So the question we want to ask today and answer hopefully is a really sort of turning the lens on the humanitarian organizations themselves and ask, you know, what can humanitarian organizations to do, do to ensure people that are affected by conflict have a sit on the table when it comes to designing, deploying and governance of this technology. Uh, and I think this also rounds out the uh, theme of the forum, which asks the questions, uh, you know, what are accountability affected people look like uh, in tech governance and humanitarian settings. So today we have four amazing panelists. Um, I'm going to start based on the time zone. Jack, who is joining us from Kuala Lumpur, it's really late, thank you so much. Uh, she's a feminist um, activist and writer. Her work is focused on internet governance and human rights, sexuality and feminist movement building. Jack led the Association for Progressive Communications Women Rights Programs, co-founded the Global Tech Back the Tech Campaign, and collectively developed the feminist principles of the internet, which we will get to hear about and unpack a little bit more today. She also served as the multi-stakeholder advisory group member for the Global Internet Governance Forum from 2015 to 2017. Welcome, Jack, thank you. Uh, the second panelist is Nanjira. She is a researcher, policy analyst, and advocacy strategist interest in understanding the unfolding impact of ICT adoption. She's a commissioner on Governan Governing Health Futures 2030, a board member at the New Ham Humanitarian Development Gateway and Digital Impact Alliance. And before that, she worked on digital equality at the World Wide Web Foundation. Our third panelist is Dragana. Uh, she's a human rights researcher and ethnographer working at the intersection of technology, human rights, and migration. Her past work has included researching the use of mobile phones by refugees in Europe, and working with community in filming police encounters in, in the United States. She's the co-founder, the founder, sorry, and executive director um, of the Localization Lab and a research fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. And finally, uh, we have Haley. Uh, she's a program manager and global technology portfolio at Internews, where she runs programs on internet freedom, online hate speech, misinformation, and digital safety and security. She's the co-founder of Safe Sisters Initiative, a fellowship that empowers women to take digital lives into their own hands. So without further ado, I'm gonna jump into this. And if I could invite Dragana to help to set the scene for us, um, how are the humanitarian organizations using technology today and how do users experience this process? 
Hi, Indu. Thank you so much for having me. Um, depends on how we want to define technology, right? Um, if we, more broadly speaking, hum humanitarian organizations and international organizations, bigger ones like um, UNHCR, UNICEF, World Food Program, um, rely on emerging technology as much as anyone else, right? To meet growing needs of, um, of beneficiaries um, around the world and are actively looking for ways to incorporate, I think, emerging technologies um, with a steep learning curve oftentimes. Um, we were talking about this the other day. So um, I was at Ocha actually when, um, Shahidi, the Haiti map was starting to, to be developed. Um, and there was so much talk and so much promise, I think, with, with this idea of crowdsourcing te technology. And I wanted to bring this up because of, of the question of how much do people actually get to participate in, in this program. Um, but I think looking at, looking at the, the data that was later released, um, a lot of the text messages that were um, that were sent for this crowdsourced map did not have much to do with um, with with the emergency itself. So it didn't seem so. Uh, instead of sending information that that was that we, we were talking about, um, like so and so is stuck under rubble, or you know, th there's a need for uh, medical attention here. It was mostly te text messages like "God bless Haiti" or asking questions, not understanding this is a one-way communication, right? Um, so I'm using this as an, as an example because it's just one of many, many examples of the humanitarian world putting so much, I think, pressure and, um, and hope in a piece, of, a piece of technology when actually um, there are societal and cultural and political problems lying underneath that technology can't solve, right? And that's a lesson that we keep learning over and over again. Um, there are many trade-offs for organizations um, and beneficiaries who use uh, technology a little bit. Um, for for organizations, there are. Um, I was talking about, yesterday. We we're talking a little bit about World Food Program and, and Palantir. Um, and while organizations like this might benefit from a partnership with an organization with a with a company, uh, a controversial company like Palantir. Our focus should be on beneficiaries and how they understand this partnership, even if it is benefiting them somehow. Um, and in this case, people are very much afraid of, the, of this company and um, in refugees in particular, because this company is working actively to, with ICE, the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement in the United States to kick out other people. So it, it's a, it, it's very, the power dynamics there are, um, are quite extreme. That there, there's, there are very few places where you can actually complain and, and, and um, add meaningful sort of participatory um, design, right? Or you know, to, to even put any kind of a comment of, I don't think this is right because I'm, I'm worried about my information because of um, be because you're relying on these organizations for your uh, for food, for uh, cash programs, for shelter, for protection, for legal aid. Um, as, as for, for refugees themselves, it, you mentioned earlier biometrics and, and fraud prevention. Um, this is also, I'm, I'm using the word controversial in a very diplomatic way, the biometrics have not been proven to, to, to prevent fraud from happening. In a few cases where there, there were, uh, I think Zara Rahman uh, uh, unpacked this a little bit, a, a lot actually um, in her uh, paper with, with engage uh, with um, uh, with the engine room, um, th there were cases of fraud where people who were working for the organizations were um, taking money and resources, not the beneficiaries themselves. But again, what are we really doing here um, when an entire system then is based on biometric technology? Um, when these systems fail, which has happened a few times in Mauritania in 2016, I believe, um, then an entire system has to, has to pause um, for people to, when people don't have access to aid, right? Uh, to services until it's back up again. In other cases, people don't have ownership, don't, don't feel like they have ownership over their own bodies and don't want to give away their biometric data, right? 
um, which keeps them outside of a system. And lastly, the, the trade-offs for, um, for beneficiaries, and, and uh, I work with refugees often, so talking about refugees in, in particular, um, using mobile technology, and I really liked um, Zoe's presentation. I, 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 I've relied a lot on their research before as well. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of concerns about traveling with a smartphone of who's being able to track where you're going, especially when you're fleeing from, uh, you know, for political reasons. Um, there are concerns about using Facebook, about using WhatsApp. Um, and I think many people in our field and maybe Haley would, would agree that um, in information security, there are oftentimes, um, this is the last point I'll make, I think I've taken too much time. There are oftentimes um, these kind of broad policies of don't use WhatsApp, don't use um, Facebook, don't use these, these kind of big name companies, uh, products of, of, of uh, big companies. But um, in my experience, I found people are using WhatsApp location to track um, each other, you know, to, to, to make sure that, that their boat arrives safely. Um, people are not stupid. They know how to use technology. They know their own risk. They know, they know what privacy risks they put themselves th through. Um, and they understand the, the trade-offs well, but I think, and they, and they look for this information uh, to be able to, to navigate um, privacy, I think, uh, very carefully. Thank you so much. Um, if I could actually, there's so much to unpack there, um, but I'm just, I'm going to jump into Jack and I'm going to ask her, I think just in terms of being solution oriented, oriented and get the most of your experiences today. Jack, you collaboratively developed the feminist principles on, of the internet. It's a set of evolving principles that act as a framework to unpack and analyze power structures. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it and how do you think humanitarian organizations could apply this in their work when it comes to the governance issues of technology? Sure, happy to. So the feminist principles of the internet is, oh, hello. <laughs> Say hello first. No, it's like a bit rude, jump straight into it. Okay, so hello. Uh, the feminist principles of the internet is basically an open iterative set of 17 principles. It's basically um, living. It's kind of, a, it was collaboratively written by a group of feminists, primarily based in the global south. Who has been, and it's based off like basically research that has been done um, by people who's working around sexuality rights, around women's rights, and so forth, with an intersection with technology. And from there to say, okay, so here are some of the issues, and the bunch of people, and these are the communities that we work with. And the communities whom we work with generally are either not included, are invisible, or are hyper visible in these conversations, particularly when it comes to data or policy. So here's our realities, and this is how technology and emerging technologies is affecting us. So rather than kind of outline some of the issues um, and how what the problems are, the principles are instead sort of like an iteration of this is the kind of internet that we want. And in these 17 principles, there are cluster areas that has to do with access, that has to do with privacy and embodiment, that has to do with safety, that has to do with governance and so forth. So I encourage you to have a look at it. It's feministprinciples.net. So how has this been used? Initially, when we wrote it, we really had the idea of using these in policy spaces. So we brought and launched the principles in the Internet Governance Forum, and we're like, here, look, here are the feminist principles of the Internet. But what we found instead is that it has been, um, in some ways, like what Dragana was saying, instead of pivoting the attention to kind of like, you know, how are humanitarian organizations working with Palantir, like two big corporations and two big institutions, let's instead look at kind of actually who is this affecting. So then the principles became much more useful to kind of engage in conversation with the broader community and um, um, people who are going to be affected by these technologies. So we're talking about women, queer women, refugees, so on and so forth. And we're also talking about activists because a lot of activists also may not necessarily have the capacity to be able to understand the technological impact of these range of things upon the issues that they're working on and on human rights. So then the principles became a very useful set of um, uh, framework to engage in things like further research. So APC has a project called the Feminist Internet Research uh, Network, 
which is trying to use kind of like this, the cluster of these principles to go further into understanding, okay, let's do research on access. Let's do research on economy. What does this mean to particular people? And so this has been really helpful in that sense. It's also been really helpful to kind of like convene activists together and say, well, what is, you know, how is health, um, how is COVID tracking technology is going to affect us specifically, our community? Uh, on bodies that are already very heavily surveilled, for example. So this has been one of the ways in which we're kind of trying to also um, uh, uh, sort of layer or uh, be kind of like a, both like an analytical tool as well as a convening tool to really unpack some of the power issues in relation to internet technology. And there's no shortcut to governance. No, like there's, it's like, there's no two way around it. You can't, there, there isn't like, there are many sets of principles, for example, that looks at data governance and humanitarian data uh, governance specifically as well, or governance around like data and development. But until and unless we are able to kind of like build collective capacity to be able to un analyze and unpack this, to, to ask the so what question, like, so what if we apply this and put this into our daily lives? Because, um, Technology infrastructure, once it's laid down, is really difficult to pull back up. And whether this infrastructure is in terms of a tool, or this infrastructure is in terms of a policy, or this infrastructure is in, term of, in terms of our imagination or habit, it's actually really hard to like peel it back. So this, what is actually most critical is where can we sort of like open up spaces to say who's actually not having this conversation right now but are most affected and how can we create spaces in which these conversations can happen. So Zoe's presentation was brilliant and that was kind of like one of the ways in which this is happening. Um, there are also many kind of like, you know, intersectional organ organizers and activists who's creating these kinds of spaces in their communities. And sometimes these kinds of spaces happen in things like a Google spreadsheet where you're trying to like, you know, crowdsource information and participate in this conversation. And then you start talking about privacy there. So you don't really know what these sites are. They're not always policy sites, but it's all part of governance because it's all part of participation and engagement. Thank you so much. Again, so much to unpack. Um, I, I'm just going to turn this back again on sort of the role of humanitarian organizations like my, our own organ that I work for, for example, I think we might primarily see our mandate as being, you know, one specific thing, which would be to provide assistance or services, for example. And, but in doing so, we are using technology. And I want to bring in Nanjira because um, I think you've worked a lot on sort of the idea of emerging technology and how can communities be part of setting the tone right from the very beginning. Um, Nanjira, could I invite you to share how you uh, sort of, you know, look at, um, this issue, not just as a data management issue, but a data governance issue, and to make sure all the people that need to be in the part of the conversation are there from the begin, from the very beginning. And what could we learn from you? Uh, sure. What could you learn from me? Huh? Uh, building, picking up from where Jacques and Rogana build up, and I must say, this is the only time. Um, I love the phrase new normal when you just have women who get to the point. So I'll build on Jack's greetings to everybody. Um, we trust that you know that we will wish you well and all that jazz and get right to it. Uh, you know, I think Jacques has nailed it. It's a governance issue, but it's not just a governance as a sort of like politically neutral issue. It's, a, it's, it's how governance is established in different settings. Even before we get to the let's say neo -ish governance issues of data governance, tech governance in humanitarian settings, we realize it's, we have to acknowledge there's a clash, if you will, uh, a forced one or an acknowledged one um, around how humanitarian organizations were set up in what contexts and where they went off to go and do the work. And that's the unresolved business. Now, there's the whole language of decolonizing that's in vogue right now to talk about. Um, and I, I'm, I'm worried about bringing that word. I'll also add decoronizing because of now of the virus and we all have to talk about it and what it's meant for everything. Put all that aside, if you feel like it fits, sure. But what we're saying is these issues do come and affect how we even talk about issues like governance. Because even before we talk about data governance, it's the technologies that are generate the data that determine also um, how that data governance confluence will be addressed. So what we can think of as a helpful frame is when you look at data governance or whatever will be invoked tomorrow, the governance stream is the most constant that we must carry. And if it's unresolved and unfinished in one area, it's for sure going to carry off to another. Going back to Dragana's, um, it was, I'm glad she brought it up, the WFP and uh, Palantir example, 
when that conversation was happening, if it, those who were privy or were, uh, were able to get access to WFP specifically as an actor who's supposed to listen to different perspectives, their whole their whole starting point was we are on the right side. We, they were not. It was practically impossible to get them to understand that they may have built the right premise but on the wrong footing. And so you can build a governance frame from that. Absolutely. You're like, you know what? We checked and cross-checked and, you know, made sure that technically the language in the contract uh, on the governance of the data, Palantir is not going to take it and it's all going to WFP, all that jazz works out. But if the premise is already fundamentally wrong, and this comes to the whole language of systems thinking that everybody's using and in the humanitarian sector right now, foresight, right? Strategic or otherwise is the language du jour. These are the things when it comes down to it that we're talking about. And the more that you know, we, we, we find language is sort of like scaffolding without really unpacking this. These things are not that complicated. And often we can end up bringing technology to sort of give us cover for addressing the unresolved issues. And that's how I would like for anybody who's trying to bring uh, data or any other governance a prefix governance of, from the tech side to realize. The tech side has its own political issues to figure out from who's designing this, what is the worldview that has shaped how they're designing it? Um, and so that when you ask whose perspectives matter, we know that it's the tech bros perspectives that are mattering. And we, we, we know that there's language of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but we know that the actuality of it is that we're not getting there. If we're really saying we want the people who are supposed to be served to do this, we're talking about an entirely different configuration of how one tech is done. And in this case, how tech is done in the humanitarian sector, which means a lot more listening. It actually even might mean that a lot more of us are out of work to be honest are we ready to contend with that because we're living through unusual times where we cannot have the luxury of you know using flaky sweet language when these are the real issues on the ground and the world is becoming one big humanitarian play field and so that's how i think if we get the basics right we can start you know building the right scaffolding for where we use more technology uh what kinds of partnerships you know humanitarian organizations go into and more importantly when to stop doing stuff because that's the other conversation we never bring in when do we actually just say right from the get we've mapped this out and this is inappropriate it doesn't matter how sweet a deal we're getting it doesn't matter who's coming giving us a free solution cost cutting or any other metric we've been convinced is the right way and we go back to what has, was supposed to be the principles of humanitarianism there's a lot more of hum, uh, humanity and humility that has to be brought to that whether it's in tech or it's even as pen and pencil or the spreadsheet that Jacques was talking about. Thank you so much. Um, just to sort of unbreak this a little bit and I think get down to the basics. Um, I'm going to invite Haley to talk about Safe Sisters because I think the approach that they used, which is a combination of self-study, uh, tool, practice, mentorship for each other, I think really sort of takes into this idea of, you know, not how do we taking matter in, into your own hands when it uh, comes to representation. Haley, can I invite you to share about your approach and how you were sort of working with um, women so they can learn from each other? Uh, sure, absolutely. And um, I can also speak a little bit about some uh, uh, sort of to build on what Ninjira was just saying about the tool approach and usability of tools and how to uh, make sure for a lot of these small tool developers, especially on the digital security side. And, you know, obviously security tools are needed in humanitarian settings during violence, during protests. We've seen VPNs be adopted overnight in countries where there has been an internet shutdown. We've seen immediately somebody needs to use a secure messaging app during protests um, or, or other types of violence. Um, and, and suddenly everybody needs them and nobody knows how to use them. And as it turns out, nobody's actually spent a lot of time to make sure that the tools themselves are usable for people, that they actually reflect the needs of the people who are about to start needing them immediately, like yesterday. Um, and, and so one of the, before I sort of get into Safe Sisters, one of the projects that we've been doing is, you know, a lot of the tool developers, especially on the digital security side are very, very small. Like sometimes the tool developers are one person. So not only do you know exactly what that person's perspective was when they made it, um, you know that there hasn't been a lot of input into the process itself. And frankly, there just isn't the capacity and so, you know, do you use the tool or do you make a new tool or do you try to make the tool better or do you, you know, do you have a third solution or fourth or fifth? And so that's one of the big things that we've been trying to kind of reckon with a little bit. Um, one of our programs called the Usability Project and is now called Adoptable is specifically working with um, tool developers like individuals and you know people who maybe have two people at their organization to actually have focus groups and have meetings and have 
real discussions um, with the communities, at-risk communities who will be using the tools before the humanitarian crisis in which they need to use them so that these uh, features and needs can be built into the tools um, you know, from the get-go or at least from the midpoint of the tool um, before it's before it's too late, frankly, before somebody tries to use the tool and they realize it's not my language, it doesn't reflect me at all. And this is the only thing that exists for that use. Um, and so that's something that we've definitely been thinking a lot about. Um, and it, it's not a perfect solution. We don't have it for sure. Um, and I think a lot of the, it would be interesting to talk later maybe about uh, different solutions that people have seen and, and, and can be effective in that space. But for the actual um, Safe Sisters project, which is a, a fellowship that we built a couple of years ago um, out of a need that we were seeing in the field where there was just not a lot of female digital security trainers. Um, and that's true everywhere, um, really. And when we were working with women, we were asking why, you know, why haven't you applied to these trainings that we were offering, you know, these co-ed kind of open trainings and people were saying, well, I didn't feel qualified. Like I'm not, a, I don't have a background in tech and I don't have a, you know, a, a computer science degree. So I didn't even apply because I just thought, well, I, I can't. And so um, we seeked uh, to build a program that really tried to overcome that by making it all for, for women, by women, you know, ar around women's needs and trying to make sure that the actual tools themselves that we were using were reflective of women's needs, but also that the, the language and the entire approach was based, I mean, was built by women who needed it as opposed to by men or others who uh, thought that's what other people needed. Um, and, and so what we thought, what we found was really interesting and, and what was so powerful about the program is that it's really trying to build a network of women who learn together and grow together and, um, and can build their own tools together that really reflects what they need and who they are and how their communities will use it, which I know is not an, a new approach, but you'd be surprised at how few things are actually use that approach um, and, and really how powerful it was for the people who um, were involved in the program. Thank you so much. I'm going to lump two questions into one and present this for everybody on the panel uh, based on what you said earlier today. And I think one of them is this idea of testing and getting ensuring that users are part of the process from the very beginning. Um, I think oftentimes humanitarian organizations, you know, will partner with a private company or use a software that's, uh, you know, that they're not building themselves because it's easier, it's cheaper. Um, and I think the other sort of element that you talked about, Haley, is that this element of digital literacy. I mean, and uh, Laura also talked about in the panel before this is in order to ensure that people understand how their data is going to be used, what does it mean to participate in governance, the sector that, so we also then, you know, ensure that there's digital literacy programs. And I think going, again, going back to the role of humanitarian organizations, I think the two question one is, should we get into this business or should we leave it to the experts? I can add a quick comment uh, on the public-private partnership side, um, but I'm not going to answer that question because it's a very, <laughs> it's a very <laughs> heavy one. Um, going off of uh, uh, Zoe's uh, presentation, uh, providing connectivity to re to refugees in particular um, is a new service, right, and requires partnerships with. Um, people who are going to help you learn how to set up networks because as humanitarians, um, no one trains you how to do uh, uh, security engineering, network testing, because um, it's not part of, maybe it should be, but it's not part of uh, uh, humanitarian uh, education or training or management. Um, it's, so it, it's not just the training, it's also the, the, the hardware, uh, it's updates. It's up, updates to, to hardware as well um, as they become faster and uh, smaller modems and routers. Um, it's also funding, so it's not just related to you know providing free tech and free stuff. That takes a lot of um, money and looking ahead to make sure that we're going to have uh, both people and uh, resources to, to to meet needs in the future. Um, 
because the worst thing you can do is promise uh, access to connectivity and then not deliver it to people. Um, having said that, there are a lot of uh, public and private sectors have very different uh, values and outputs, right? Outputs for, for private sector should be the hockey stick growth, right? And values of Silicon Valley tend to be moving fast and breaking stuff and uh, disruption and uh, failing up um, and profit at all costs. That is very much uh, in conflict with humanitarian principles of impartiality, of neutrality, of do no harm. Um, so it's it's natural that people who are beneficiaries would be very suspicious when um, when these partnerships happen. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. At that, but it's um, it's complicated, and I think I have a stance of uh, keeping public-private partnerships uh, to skill sharing because those tend to be very. Uh, um, the, the, those tend to be partnerships where there are clear outcomes, um, more, I guess, more clear outcomes that people's data, people's digital bodies are not at risks, right? Um, but it is complicated if you're going to be delivering um, services and aid today to a much larger group of people. Um, it has to be in people's terms, right? I want to jump in there because two words jumped at me into uh, expertise and testing. Um, if in this particular community of humanitarians, the expert is not the person you're serving, you have the wrong premise, go home and sleep, I think. And by this, I mean the following. We have this, I think it's maybe a human condition or otherwise, political or otherwise, that when somebody is displaced from this setting, whether they've cr crossed an ocean to try and get to safer you know, pastures or whatever, they don't know anything, they're helpless, we are there. I mean, it's, it's a, it, it appeals to a certain human need to be wanted or otherwise. So that so much so that then it creates this notion that these are not experts in their lived experience, you know? And that's been the failure. And we've seen time and again, there are too many stories at this point that everybody has come across at least one about how that has failed to serve, whether it's by going with tech or whatever predated the technologies of today in sectors like these. Um, and the, the whole idea of testing and uh, testing in the sense of using technologies, I think we've already started a half-baked solution in that question. It should be about conceptualizing. And at the conceptualization stage is even asking whether technologies, whether it's technology X, because of the solutionism we see today. So somebody's, you know, I'm giddy off of a meeting with some tech bro from somewhere who has not seen the world beyond one square mile radius of where they live has a, an idea about how the technology they've built is going to streamline your process or otherwise. And I come giddy and want to introduce it. And so now I'm like, oh yeah, let me ask the community. I've already missed the mark. I need to be asking more questions. And we have a moral responsibility to go back to asking very simple questions. What are we trying to do for a community that is is, is requiring humanitarian help. And, you know, there's always stories about how in the last, one of the last typhoons in Philippines, you know, people came in with all these resources they thought the community needed, but the community had mobilized around them. And they're like, no, that's not what we needed. If you had asked us, we'd have told you. And this, you know, stories are littered. I don't know if now we're just fetishizing fail fairs or we're just uh, unwilling to learn. And that's where I think going, the, the, the solutions to these questions are actually back to very basic things about what are we trying to do? And if we do not have the intellectual and moral honesty to ask these questions, then maybe, as I said, we all need to use this year and rest and think about what are we saying? Because we're moving faster to a world where we are all going to be in very possible scenarios in this need of humanitarian world. And even if we are the people setting a precedent and are setting the wrong precedent, it's not too big a leap to think tomorrow you and I will be on the other side of things. And we'll be like, wait, we used to be on the other side and we didn't get it right. And then we're going to be on the receiving end of you know, half-baked problematic solutions because we didn't start getting it right. So I just wanted to say, this is even less a technical issue. It is actually a political, intellectual and moral one. Thank you so much. Um, I asked, um, I put this question on the Twitter about what to ask the panelists today. And someone asked me to say, unpack this idea of digital litter that we're producing some, you know, coming up with this idea of techno solutions. So uh, I'm going to invite Jack and Haley to add to that conversation because I'm sure you have lots. Of digital litter, is that right? Yeah. Yes, yesterday I think there was a conversation around digital litter, like rubbish. Yes. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, I assume we're not, are we talking about e-waste? Okay, maybe we're talking about sort of environmental impact uh, and ICTs, which is actually a huge issue. And I think it's also been for a long time, there's been people who's been doing it simultaneously, a work that has a very long trajectory, as well as one that is only emerging in sort of like um, a, a real criticality, like people paying much more attention into it um, uh, in the past couple of years. Um, I don't know if I'm the best person to talk about this, but maybe I will one hook that as uh, I was, I was li listening to Dagana and Nanjira talking, the one thing that, that kept bugging me is this notion of kind of scalability, right? Like solutions always have to be scalable. We need to have solutions that can grow and grow and grow and grow. And that in itself is a really weird ideology that's coded into how we think about solutions. Like why must something grow? Because when you grow something, what you're essentially saying is things need to be consolidated and centralized, which means you're putting much more distance between the person who is, uh, like, you know, the distance between the person whose data is being collected, the people who's actually, like, you know, making decisions around what data, how to analyze this data, how to connect data, how to make decisions around this data, and the people who's actually taking action based on this data. It's just making this distance wider and wider. And the broader this distance, this, this, is, this distance is a space of power. It's a space of power disparity. That's what it is. And I think at the end of the day, the people who will actually benefit from this are not even governments. I think it's basically just corporations because corporations can straddle between government to government, go from one place to another and say, hey, we did this here. Maybe we can go there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And governments are also, well, some governments are pretty long term in terms of uh, thinking about dynasties. But they're also quite short term if you think about kind of like, you know, um, the, the ability to like be able to benefit of certain things. So one is I think there is a certain kind of like uh, a need to also challenge some of these ideologies or assumptions that's built into kind of our responses to think about the automatic best solution is one that's scalable. Uh, or one that requires every single member of the community to be able to participate in every single level of the process, because that's also like, what? Why? Like, whose compulsion is this? I didn't ask for a technological solution, thank you very much, but now here I am, now I have to like participate in all of your processes. So that's also a little bit like, hang on a minute, also let's rethink some of these things and, and like, you know, where do we begin? And, and, but, be, but I also am very aware that there are some things in which, um, you know, I mean, I love technology. This is why I'm a tech, feminist tech activist, right? Like there's something about it that's, you know, uh, intrinsically uh, can really like transform power relations. I think that the question around like really capacity is super key. Uh, and the stuff that Haley was talking about, um, the stuff that Nanjira was talking about, the stuff that really like, you know, the ability to be able to kind of like wrap your heads around it and understand it and then play with it. I think that's really super key. And I don't know at which level we need to break it down. Um, and maybe it's really even at the, uh, at the level of language because technology has long enjoyed this position of like, you know, um, uh, I don't know, neutrality and invincibility and positivity and so on and so forth. So maybe it's even at that level, but there's something that needs to happen there so that it actually becomes meaningful. So that it actually becomes uh, uh, something that is able to support um, specific issues that we are facing right now. And, uh, and the thing that is, that, um, that also came to me very clearly is that at any moment of crisis, people organize, they organize really quickly and they organize really well and they organize not necessarily out of nowhere because some of this organizing has also been happening. And there's like, it's based off like long relationships of trust. So then the question is what, how do we resource and strengthen some of this existing organizing that's happening in different, different manner, different shapes, different forms without trying to say this all needs to be one ring to rule them all, no? That kind of a way. So I think, yeah, these were some of the things that came into mind. Now, one response towards uh, environmental uh, impact and, and technology. I think one really interesting thing that's coming up and maybe could also be useful in this conversation is this whole question around, well, how do we think about um, technology and digital infrastructure more around public goods uh, or kind of like, you know, thinking about it more as a kind of like a governance of commons or community commons rather than as a kind of like government thing. Uh, so that's like some, again, different kind of frameworks and then all, like, you know, different frameworks to, to engage with a big issue. Thank you so much. Um, 
I think the in, environmental impact is a very real question if we sort of talk about the ecosystem that goes beyond human. Um, I think yesterday's digital litter question was actually we're creating all these digital solutions that are really nonsense, creating a lot of noise in space, as in it's literally <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> um, but uh, Haley, um, could I invite you to add into that um, as well? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I. I don't know. I feel like using the word litter, digital litter speaks for itself. I mean, it it's garbage, you know, it shouldn't exist. I don't, it, it I think that is maybe enough of that. Uh, I don't know what I can add to that. <laughs> that piece of the conversation besides don't do it. If you don't know what you're doing and you don't have an idea of why, what, or where it's going to be used, don't just make it just because it you think it needs to be made, you personally think it needs to be made, or you have funding to make it. Um, but I think that's essentially what every single person on this panel and many people listening uh, know already. So uh, the piece that I would love to just like add on to is what Jack was saying with the capacity. And I think there's this one thing I, I guess I touched on a little bit and we have all touched on, but is this chasm that feels between technologists, the people who actually create the technology and the people who use it. And the chasm, I think it's language as Jack was saying, I think it, I mean, it, it, it's a million layers of, of power, which I love. I love calling it that, um, but it isn't actually as big as it seems, and it's a lot of perception of power and 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 language, and the inability to actually bring people together is a myth. And I think it's a figment, and um, but it's really, really, really strong, and um, it's pretty unbelievable what people don't let themselves uh, engage with because they just don't feel. They perceive that that chasm is so wide, and I think that we don't help anything by saying by talking in these hushed tones about you know these different technologies and what it's going to do, and you know it's going to change the world, and you know, and then people feel like I don't know how to I don't what what am I supposed to do with this thing, you know, when they actually get it, and 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 it's not it's not translated, it's not localized. I mean, Dragna can talk a lot about the localization of these things as well. But I just think that it that is one of the areas that we need to be working in from every single angle, the chasm and trying to un build a bridge over it, I guess, or you know, fill it up with something else because filling it up with conversation actually, I think, about having these conversations, engaging with people, these things are not as hard as we make them seem a lot of times. The technologies are really not that complicated in so many ways, and people are absolutely capable of learning them. But if we're not pitching them right, and we're not discussing them, and they're not being designed by people who need them, then yeah, it's going to feel like, well, I'm not going to adopt this. I'm not going to use this thing, and I don't even need it. Uh, even when it is actually a solution that somebody has. So I think that's another conversation, maybe for another time, but one that I would love <laughs> to continue. Can I add to that a little bit? Um, on, I mean, on, on the issue of who gets to design the technology too, um, it's, especially communication technology has the ability to reinforce power dynamics within communities that we work with. And there's a lot of responsibility to take here as well. Um, the Example, uh, well, um, that I used for paper for UNHCR earlier this year was on the connectivity for refugees program. When it's only men who uh, are able-bodied, you know, like who know how to read English, uh, who have a cell phone, if they're the only ones who get to access technology, who get to access the internet, um, if you're building internet connectivity in a refugee camp, for example, that's centralized, the people kind of have to walk to the center. To, uh, to use um, uh, like internet cafes, then oftentimes women and young girls are not gonna get to go uh, down to that center uh, after dark because they don't feel comfortable walking. Um, pe people with different abilities are not gonna be able to access the same technology. Um, elderly, like pe people with mobility issues, people with health, certain health issues are not gonna have the same access physically um, to the digital world. So what ends up happening is people become information brokers. They are the ones who get access to everything and then share information based on what they think um, people need to hear. And, that, and that's what reinforces um, people who, who do have power within communities to have more power and people who have less, right? Um, 
to have even less. And a quick example of this, um, saying with, with innovation and, and refugees, um, a few apps I think that were created post 2015, there were almost 2000 apps that were created in 2015 refugee crisis, most of which people just never heard of or didn't use, but all of which were created with this good intention of, um, you know, wanting to, to create a, a safer passage or safer communication for refugees or access to information. Meanwhile, meanwhile people were like, I can just Google this um, or use WhatsApp. Um, not to say that this is not helpful, but rather that jumping in, thinking that you, you know the answer for other people uh, might create more problems. But um, Garbatna was one app that was created by Syrian refugees. Um, it was actually really popular because it met people's needs. Um, I think another one was called Bureau Crazy, like bureaucracy, but uh, help, helping folks, I know, I love the title, uh, helping folks navigate through uh, Germany's asylum system through paperwork. But who, ended, who this ended up working for was young men because it was young men who created these apps. Um, and so it was positioned you know, to work for them by, by design and accessibility and, um, and everything. I think it was criticized quite a bit eventually for, for that, that it's not enough to just make sure that it's people who are you know, affected communities who get to participate in creating the technology, but rather there has to be a rep representative group um, from these communities to make sure that we're addressing everybody's needs through universal design. Thanks so much, Jagana. I think someone was supposed to time check me a while ago, but they haven't. So <laughs> um, I'm going to use this. I, I know I, we could just go on. And th uh, I'm going to actually thank the panelists because Laura is supposed to be taking questions from the chat boxes and she'll come back to us with it. Uh, I'll just take this moment that when I have the time to thank you so much for being part of this. It was great to have this conversation. And actually, I would like to continue having this conversation with you and other um, colleagues that might be in the chat because we're really actually wanting to explore and move forward on this. Uh, so please feel free to reach out anytime. And Laura, over to you. Wow, thank you. Um, so I actually was asking Murray if, if he was okay and he, and I were on the edge of our seats and so interested that we neither of us were cared what time it was. So uh, it's your fault essentially for uh, such an engaging and interesting discussion. Um, we're gonna have a short plenary conversation now and we've got probably about 20, 25 minutes max for this. So it's, again, it's gonna be not enough time but I hope the conversation will continue in many fora in the years to come. Um, and I just want to, um, to thank all of you, first of all, and as we welcome Zoe back um, to join us for this plenary panel, um, I wanted to just acknowledge that there may be lots of feelings out there in the audience um, around, many of us may be cheering at the screen. Um, I think that's been going on all day um, because we're seeing, um, I remember very deeply being involved in humanitarian conferences and particularly humanitarian tech conferences where everything was very uniform looking. Um, and certainly you would not get um, many panels that were packed with, um, ladies and uh, and women identified folks and um, generally just this fantastic energy where everyone is thinking so deeply about their role and place in this community that we all are together and that we share with the communities that we are serving. There may be others out there who are hearing some of this stuff for the first time. This uh, is fair to say this is the first CDAP conference that has had so much of this flavor, although we've always had this element of participation in our mission. Um, and so for those people, I would say, if you are feeling uncomfortable and you have questions and things that you've heard for the first time, concepts, ideas, ask questions and we will answer them. Um, and if you're just feeling uncomfortable, it's a great anonymous place to share that too, just to say, this is really challenging. I don't know how I will implement this in my workplace. Um, so I want to uh, open with a couple of questions um, for um, actually for Indu and for Zoe, because I think Indu, you've had to be in your moderator role. Um, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to just share your reflections on that panel in a more sort of as a speaker, um, but also just to reflect, I think that ICRC is um, uh, in many ways, uh, you know, a beacon in the humanitarian sector for all sorts of reasons, but it's also, you know, one of the oldest and most venerable uh, humanitarian institution and is, the, it's a really hard to overstate the role that the humanitarian principles play for the ICRC in, in the way that it acts and the way that every person in the Red Cross movement um, thinks. 
um, as Hotel California, as they say. Um, and so I just, but I want to reflect that the ICRC has also led data governance conversations in the space with their handbook on data protection. Um, and I wanted to just see if you, if you feel like reflecting on, you know, when you're taking a, a huge engine, a huge organization that is so principles focused and you're taking those principles and applying them to a world where we're realizing those principles may not have covered everything. And perhaps we need to reinterpret those principles for a more just world. How, how is that working for the ICRC? And, and how do you see the progression of the, the organization from those early thoughts around data protection to where it is now? Thank you so much. And thank you for allowing me to plug in the data protection handbook. I think there is a line in there around biometric, which I really like and is so proud, is that collection of bio, even if it's legal, it's not ethical. I really like that. Um, so I think it's um, that's been a reference for the sector and I'm really glad to be um, you know, I, do, I wasn't a part of this, but I'm glad the organization was. I also want to plug in another project my colleagues have been involved in, which is called Digital Dilemmas. Um, it's an online exhibition. It used to be a physical exhibition. It's now an online exhibition and essentially ask these questions. And I think, much like the rest of the sector, we're grappling with this question. I am in my role as community engagement advisor for the organization. And this is why I wanted to bring everyone on this panel is, a question that we keep asking, for example, is the use of social media or third party platforms. This is where we can uh, provide information to communities. We can also see feedback from communities. This is also could come up as a preferred means of communication for communities. But when we know we have no influence around the governance and the metadata could be used for X number of reasons, what is our role and responsibility within that? Are we creating a negative incentive by being there and, in, like, you know, by part, you know, feeding into that ecosystem. And I think much like the rest of the sector, we're grappling with this issue. I'm grappling with this issue. Uh, our colleagues are grappling with this issue. And I think there's so much. And when I engaged with Jack many years ago, we talked about the future risk. The, the way we are looking and deploying technology right now, some of these things, even though we engage and examine and explore this issue on a daily basis, the risks in the future might be very different than what we're looking at right now. And what is our, I think, and this is where I personally sort of um, uh, get confused is on the one hand, um, when we talk about agency and people being able to make their own decisions, you know, um, what if they actually choose something, you know, maybe potentially could cause harm, then what's our role and responsibility towards that? Uh, but also, are we applying a protectionist approach in a place where we, that's not necessary? So I would say, I think there are some things that we've gotten right. We engage in this conversation, but also like most of the rest of the sector, we're grappling with some of these issues ourselves. Thank you so much, Indy, for sharing that. And I uh, do love to put you on the spot, obviously. <laughs> um, so I want to turn uh, quickly to Zoe and welcome her back as well. Um, and my question to you, Zoe, is thank you for the fantastic video earlier. I so appreciated that. Um, and I wanted to, um, to ask, um, very often when, uh, when people turn to technology, and particularly I think my background is in SMS, as some of you may know, to text messaging, they're doing so because they're looking for something that is less, relatively less expensive to reach a large number of people. How do we make interventions such a, like that more accessible to people who live with disabilities, to older people, to people who maybe are not digitally liter literate, when that it increases the overall cost of the intervention. How can we make the case for that successfully? Great, thanks so much, Laura. I mean, I think there's a, a few different parts of that. And um, one of the things that my team has been looking into is the, the multitude of, of mobile technology, the benefits that can come with that when you give people the effective tools. And we talked about with the panel, the wonderful panel talked about digital literacy earlier. And I think that when you equip people with the knowledge of, of the risks and how to use the tool effectively that can not just affect whatever program you're working on, but other parts of their lives. So that could help them run their business, for example, keep in touch with loved ones. You can have these multiplier effects. So I think that there needs to be a recognition when you're using these modalities of, of the wider benefits that can come from mobile technology. I would say specifically when including people with disabilities, there's, there's a case to be made because these technologies can also be a major assistive technology in a way that allows people to connect, for example, to, to sign translators over video translation services, uh, screen readers. It, it can help them navigate the, the barriers in 
in their lived realities and, and overcome some of those. Um, and one last thing from the video, one of the, the users was mentioning one of the findings of the report was that it's really important when we are designing these, these tools to make sure that a variety of different channels are, are available uh, so that when people have specific needs, uh, it's not just a hotline, it's a hotline plus maybe an SMS or USSD based service to account for these different needs so that you're not excluding any, any one population, whether that be people who are elderly, people who have lower level, levels of literacy or, or people with various impairments. Well, thanks so much, Zoe, and great to have you back for this plenary panel. Um, so I, these questions really are open to any one of you. It's quite a big panel, so um, do step up and step back if you think your participation has been more or less than it could be um, over the next few minutes. But we have a question from Stin Albers, hi, um, who says, how, to, how do we shift the power when we international agencies receive money and feel that we need to show correlation, if not causation, between the money we receive um, which is often project-based and the immediate impact it has within the timeline of the project cycle, creating project designs that are output focused and the best way to show our contribution is to slap a logo on it. So how do we shift the power within the political economy of the humanitarian system as we know it? Any ideas? <laughs> I'll give it a go if no one else wants to be the provocative Thank you, thought as suggestion, seeing as I went big on moral responsibilities. I found in our work, and especially those who are sort of in that intermediary space where you're receiving, uh, you know, you're sort of like really an intermediary between funds and projects and all that. I think the times are here. It's not the times are coming, they're here. But we also have to push back. Um, even before we take on resources. And I, I know what I'm saying is actually really difficult to do in practice, but it's necessary because how much longer can we keep normalizing harm? I mean, I, I live very in proximity to many communities that are served. Sometimes I think Kenya is like any humanitarian's big dream, right? <laughs> There's always something to do here. So we know we've seen the test bed of experimentation that has been, and most often than not, on the negative side of things than the net positive. And there is a responsibility there to start shifting the power is literally a power conversation with those who are sending resources to start taking systemic views, to start not thinking about just how, you know, we, we're tired of the hurry up and wait. And even those who are working on this, you know you're tired of the hurry up and wait. Deploy, 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 but then find everything else that was supposed to carry it forward is missing. And so I think it's just little ways to start saying, how do we push back on the conversation and say, well, we appreciate that this eventually could become a project approach. We might need to, to take a bit more time or accommodate in our budget lines and in our program timelines, the fact that we need to do a bit more due diligence and assessment on whether this is the best approach now, or it could be the best approach a couple of, it's really bringing diplomatic language, if I may put it that way. And that's a responsibility, I think a, a, a few more, and might not be you as a project manager, but you push back to your CEO's talking points when he goes for the big meeting with funders. It's absolutely imperative because we know that this knowledge has been funneled back up, if you want to say communities are given feedback, but it's stuck in a missing middle where who knows who has the access to say these things. Um, and it shouldn't always take an Nigeria who has, <laughs> few filters if you may call it that you will not always find an injera when you know you've heard this from the communities so i think that's one small way to start shifting the power just to build on that as well i think there needs to be a com like a changing like we need to change the metrics of how we understand impact and i think there's been a lot of really good work actually that's been done around looking at impact evaluation assessment i'm just not sure why that is there is a, a little bit of a lag between this and then the kind of like, well, actually, we just want to see numbers. And the fact of seeing like, you know, this kind of like numbers economy is also driven by a very particular kind of machination around technology, right? Like we should be able to see this if there's like a bunch of lots of numbers to be able to, to bring it down. But then that's let's compare between this and say a much more considered process like the video that Zoe showed. So let's talk about this versus like a bunch of numbers that actually has no meaning. And then in between that, you also have like real stories about harm that is being affected through this particular process. So not only are you not achieving the intended impact of actually benefiting specific communities, it's actively causing harm, but instead this is how impact could look like. Um, and this is the actual timeframe of an impact. 
that is slightly different. And yes, to donor advocacy, yeah, to fund the advocacy, this is also work that is done. And I think a lot of larger organizations is able to do this work rather than the communities themselves. And sort of speaking also to your point, Indu, about do we then like, you know, use social media when we know social media is so extractive and so on. It's like, well, yeah, but not for everything, no? Like, okay, I would say use social media for like, you know, mobilizing, but don't use it for organizing, for example. Broadcast, but not discourse. So stuff like that. But then as an organization or even as an, advocate, an, an activist like myself with access to different kinds of, you know, policy or discussion spaces, then that's the responsibility to also say, actually, we need to change some of the internal things that's happening here. So that's also some of the, the you know, spaces of change that, that can take place. I would actually like to come in as uh, in my organization as one of the people pushing the sift the power conversations. Um, I think within the sector, and I think if we talk about the accountability industry, we've also prioritized a standardization and technocratization of accountability, as it were, measuring impact, as um, uh, Stain said. And, uh, and this is partly donor driven, so it doesn't actually hide it, what it does within the numbers and everything is actually it prioritizes upward accountability donors at the expense of participatory approaches with the community, for example. And this is something that, you know, we're trying hard to push our organization sift in that direction. Um, and I, again, um, we all know there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you all for that thoughtful set of responses. Dragana, did you want to add something? Go for it. Yeah, a point I made yesterday on a participatory approach, um, oftentimes, I think that there's been a, a, a really great humanitarian norm pushed towards participation, both in, maybe even driven by innovation um, spaces, but it's, it's affecting other more traditional humanitarian programming to become more open and participatory on paper. But what ends up happening often is that it's actually just feedback and it's more performative than anything else that in the very later stages we are asking uh what uh what do you think of you know of, of how do you feel about this programming so it's not meaningful participation but but rather it, um it, it it seems more cosmetic than anything else um another point i wanted to, to just add on um to what jack was saying uh, when it when it comes to to use of, of, of platforms, um, I think I just I just want to um, advocate again for for I think we oftentimes put a stop to uh, you know uh, obviously we don't want people to, to put information we don't want to actively push people to put information through platforms where we know we're putting them in danger we don't want people to use platforms where we know that they might be you know in, in danger. Um, but having said that, I think a rule of thumb should always be to meet people at eye level and, um, and believe them when they say, I want to use Facebook Messenger to, um, to communicate with something. You know, I think we have a responsibility to provide uh, information, especially on here are the threats with using this platform. Um, and then there are also, because humanitarian organizations are, uh, have, aren't, I think subject to, to the same kinds of um, to the same kinds of data protection mechanisms um, as private companies and uh, um, maybe academia. We have a responsibility, not, not a legal one, but maybe an ethical responsibility to um, to provide that kind of uh, I don't know if educational material is the right um, phrase here, but I find that to be most helpful. That that people you know, have a good understanding of, all right, here's how Facebook sells my data to, to, to third parties. I still wanna use it because my family back home, this is what they use. And um, it's, the, you know, it's, it's the easiest thing for me. And we, we skip over that so much, I think. Can I just add on to that just real quick? Last thing is just, um, I love that. And I think it's totally true. And I think what we skip over is the you know, not the tools themselves, but there's information around the tools that you can create. I mean, that is still extremely useful. You don't have to make a tool every time. And sometimes the tools, you know, don't fit perfectly and they're just not going to because as we were talking about before, one person made it, but it is the only tool that does that thing and people should be using or, or could be using it or need it. And so it might not fit exactly, but there is a 
the value is in explaining and working with people to understand why maybe this is the tool that could be helpful in that specific situation. And maybe, you know, kind of working with them to figure out why does this matter? Why would this matter to you? Why could this be used by you and your community? And having the community write about and explain to others themselves why and not, you know, you don't have to write it. You don't have to build a new tool that's like slightly different, but, you know, similar. Um, you can you can give context around it and, and, and work with people to, to, to make sure that they have the tools that they wanna use and have all the resources available to them. And so I think that's another piece that um, we can explore in another chat. And how much and longer we need to chat. <laughs> Go ahead, Jack. Go ahead. Sorry, just very quickly. Sometimes it's also not like not just tools and information, but sometimes it's actually tactics. And that's the more important thing. Like, you know, how do we also then sort of like um, be able to surface and share tactics around, yeah, around the use of Facebook Messenger in safe ways in particular contexts? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're having, there's a, an interesting conversation going on um, in the chat around, um, I have several thoughts which are kind of interlinked, so I'll try and keep them brief, but around what should I read? What have you read that's really useful? And it reminds me of the, I live in the United States and um, the conversation that we've been having here around um, Black Lives Matter and the responsibility that those of us who hold privilege have to educate ourselves about the nature of that privilege and how we can use it to help other people. Um, and I, I think that we're not challenging the power and the efficacy of the humanitarian system. We're saying that it's very self-supporting and could act as more of an ally to in in spaces where we could be recentering other people's power at more appropriately. Um, it makes me wonder um, whether we should put together a reading list for those of us who are coming to, it's completely possible to have an august and very distinguished career in the humanitarian space and never encounter these ideas. Um, and so I wonder whether um, we should um, put together a, a reading list. So please do add to that in the chat um, for attendees and panelists if you want, and we will we'll put that somewhere on the CDAT website. I also wanted to just mention that I think the role of evidence here is really important. Um, and Internews, for example, has done fantastic work um, and made a practice of doing research, action research, not the only ones, but I'm thinking of it because there were papers that were promoted through the CDAT network a couple of years ago. For example, we mentioned the refugee crisis in Europe a few years ago, looking at how these communities are not homogenous and the refugee leaping off a boat with a smartphone looking for Wi-Fi was actually a bit of a red herring and really asking questions about impact and how we can do things. Um, so just thinking also about this notion, we all need to learn and share more learning um, tactics to your point, Jack, but also um, just educating ourselves on the thinking that already exists um, and acting as more of an ally. So that's, I'm sorry, I took my moderator hat off for a second and got over excited. Um, I guess I might just um, finish up by um, by coming around to each of you and, and asking the same question actually that I asked before, which is, we all are cogs in a big system here. And for some of us, it's harder to think about how we could make change. Um, but if we are putting that ally hat on and thinking about how we can decenter our own power and recenter other people's, what would what should people be doing the next time they sit down at their desk and um, perhaps one idea um, for something that people could do differently i'm not going to call on people in order i would advise you to to just jump in when you have a thought if you if you would and then we'll wrap up in just a few minutes and do feel free to share any other closing thoughts that you want to share just very briefly i will pick on people if no one speaks i can start us off uh, great um so i think I've loved the conversation that we've had today, and I, I think it's relatively simple, but it's just asking the simple questions and, and meeting people where they are and starting, starting with that, understanding people's own technology and communication landscapes before you design any sort of programming and understanding that local context. For me, that's just the most important takeaway. Um, and I think that's especially important in the COVID-19 context of you know information, has never been more important, nor more convoluted to find. And, and we're relying more on remote technologies to deliver that than ever before. So it's really important that we get both elements of that, the modality and the content of the communications, absolutely right in order to save lives. Um, so I, I think, yeah, just starting with the simple questions, meeting users where they are. I'll pick up from Zoe and just say, um, 
I think the way I've been thinking about it lately, I, I added, I, I said it in we, but I mean, people have been speaking, are they being heard? Uh, part of it is when we seek out more resources to help us understand, we also create a perverse economy that we must be worried of, where um, you're asking for those, this is an existential issue. Many people who are growing up under this limelight of all these unfortunate projects and experimentations to find ways to articulate better what they've been saying in other ways um, is an important thing to keep in mind even as we create book clubs and reading lists and all that jazz. They, this information has been out there. Even in your own organizations, I'm sure there has been that feedback. There's somebody in your organization, probably looks like me, who's closer to a community, who has that feedback. Have you created a safe space for them to share that back with you? Let's be very careful and worry about how we need to be absorbing the information because it's not always going to come in the written intellectual big English form. Thank you. Thank you. I'll add to that a bit. Um, I think there has to be political will also to localize um, this work. And without that, we are, we are still working sort of topically, right? Um, there has to be political will to actually help people that, that we are supposed to be um, providing aid and services for instead of keeping, you know, yesterday, um, Adelina said uh, resilience, not reliance. And um, I think that's stuck with a lot of people um, because we build aid so often on, on reliance. Um, we build this on colonial lines, on neoliberal philosophy underneath everything. I think yesterday I, was, I used the example of IKEA shelters, but um, I think Laura, we've talked about this too, that that are meant to last for three years. You know, there is this innovative piece of technology in, in a sense that it's new, it's uh, uh, it's insular, it's, it's better than tents, but it's still meant for three years when 78% of the refugees end up uh, in pro protracted refugee situations. For, for generations at a time. So what's it really saying that you can stay here, but just for a short amount of time, we're not really offering any kind of meaningful uh, opportunities for you, um, any meaningful solutions, any options for you, but rather just kind of leading you to, to these conclusions. Um, the participatory approach, just being part of that, that whole package of, of um, we're going to keep you here. And there's just, it's, yeah, um, having lived in one, it's it's an absolute helpful because you're relying on systems that aren't designed to to work for you, whatsoever. Um, and then to, and I don't know the answer for how do, how do we get that political will to to push not just at a time of a pandemic, not just to put to push the work um, of humanitarian aid into um, local offices, but to push decision making and to give up the money. Thanks so much, Dragana. Um, so Jack and Haley and Zo and I think, no, Zoe went already, Indu has not yet gone. If you could keep your comments very brief because we do need to wrap up and hand over to Marion. Over to you, Jack, perhaps if you could jump in. Sure. Um, I think as, even as Dragon was saying, I was thinking sometimes human, humanitarian response work as well as technology, they can make the politics of things rather invisible. And I think it would be really, really helpful to actually make the politics, i.e. the power visible. And that we are talking about different kinds of bodies and bodies who, are, who face different kinds of discrimination, different kinds of visibility, and where things are impacted differently. And I think even if we can begin from just making some of these things visible and then unpack it, throughout all of the layers, I think that will actually be quite helpful. Thank you, Jack. Um, Indy, um, you're hiding. There you are. <laughs> you know, I was going to build on what Jack said, and my colleague Shelley, who is also typing in the chat box, made the sticker for us a while ago, which was to ask ourselves in our conversation, who am I missing? Um, and I think when we sort of talk about even this panel, you know, while it's um, all of us are women, it's fantastic. I think we're also all able-bodied women, for example, at least visibly able-bodied. So I think a simple thing for us while being sort of overwhelmed by everything around you, just to ask this and apply this every day. Thanks, Indu. All right, um, Haley. 
I, yeah, my I just wanted to reemphasize what somebody had said earlier about pushing back. I mean, as international organizations and larger organizations, our ability to educate and push back on donors who are asking for things that we know are impossible. We have the we're in the position to be able to do that in a privileged position to be able to do that. And it helps everybody if these conversations are had at the donor level and are really emphasized by organizations that have the clout to be able to push these concepts. And so it's our responsibility uh, to lift the boat for everybody and make these conversations a lot easier to have so that others don't have to have them in the future. Thanks so much. And thank you to the whole panel. This has been a really wonderful day and um, I've enjoyed every second of it. And I particularly want to thank those of you for whom these conversations about uh, racism and confronting our colonial past and the rootedness of the humanitarian system in that past is, is not optional and is something you live every day. And we're grateful for your activism and hope that we can, we can be better allies to you all in, in future and to the communities that we serve. Um, thank you so much to the team, the CEDEC team, for the invitation to join you. And uh, I'm delighted to hand over to my friend and colleague, Marion, to take us home. Thanks so much, Laura. It's been an amazing two days, and I'm delighted to be back here now just to say a final thank you to everybody. Um, as we conclude the conference, I really believe that you, the people on this call today and those who were on there yesterday, our moderators and our speakers and our audience have helped us over the two days to really use this platform to shift the emphasis and discourse from top-down technological solutions and humanitarians to one that is far more wide-ranging and inclusive in its perspectives. This was the overall aim of the conference and I believe we have achieved that to a degree. A special note of thanks to our keynote speakers, Sibello and Anisuya for their inspirational and frank discussions. I think many of us were quite uncomfortable, as you said, Laura, listening to this. It's been really useful for our future thinking. Uh, a very skillful moderation from yesterday from Paul Keneally and from Arati Krishnan, and today, Laura, yours. You're all friend, long-term friends of CDAC, and I think it's been wonderful to have you there to make sure that our fabulous array of dynamic speakers have had their perspectives heard. So thank you to the moderators and the speakers. I have to do a special call out for Arati Krishnan. She's been accompanying us in CEDAC the last few months and as part of our steering committee for this event and has really helped us think through many of the themes that we've raised here. I would really ask you all to go back and reread Arati's background paper, uh, looking at how we need to make sure that people are at the heart of design, not just a privileged few. Um, thankfully, we will also have many of the keynote, all of the keynote speakers uh, on YouTube very shortly and all of your sessions. So hang on, we'll have them there for you. A special thanks to all of the audience who have persevered through the long time on, online. Really thank you. We've been so fortunate to have our event management team who are called Maximize Your Time and who really accompanied us in the last few weeks trying to help us get this right. It's a new way of working for CDAC, this online business. And I know our CDAC lead, Murray, Garrard has been really enjoying working with you all. So thank you. A final parting word. We've heard a lot from Anasua in her presentation about the dominance of men and who build the infrastructure for the internet and algorithms. But I think we've seen, especially today and yesterday, but especially in the last panel or two, that there are women out there who are leading tech thinking. They just need to be heard. And I think that's possibly one of our big messages at the end of today. Uh, now at four o'clock, uh, our members will be coming into a new session uh, to talk about the future, the next five years for CDAC, and we will bring many of the outcomes of this event to that discussion. So we're hoping we'll have many of you back online on a different link very shortly. Uh, stay well and safe, and thank you all very much again, and uh, we hope that you're all well and safe in these times of COVID. Thank you.